As overblown and self-aggrandizing as it is, the Great Supercar Coliseum is a wellspring of entertainment. Not the ever-increasingly decadent and depraved flexfest cesspool of super-rich supercar influencer culture, where the only thing that matters is how much of daddy's money was beamed directly into the accounts of the UAE exotic car dealer this time. No. I mean the Olympians from Ferrari, Jaguar, Bugatti, Aston Martin, Porsche, Lamborghini, Maserati, and Mercedes, all vying throughout the past hundred years to be crowned king of the supercars, and therefore the best automobile the world had yet produced. And if there's one surefire way to do that, it was, and is, to be the fastest. Why is that? As much as we tell ourselves we're so impressed that the progress of technology has allowed cars to go this fast, that the indomitable human spirit refuses to back down in the face of all rationality and laws of physics, is it just a reptilian desire to be in control of a machine that you know no one else could match you in? The fantasy of some invincible power you could exert upon the world with the flick of a gear stick and the press of a pedal. Either way, being the purveyor of the machine that raises these questions in the first place is something that the giants of the industry have traded back and forth with bitter ferocity. Terrific stories have been born from this historic and ongoing melee. The Porsche 959 and the Ferrari F40, stillborn projects like the Aston Martin Bulldog and the ever pontificated Vector. This is a cars and bids. Even as the rubble of World War II was still being cleared, the war decade still two years from ending and rationing still in full effect, William fucking Lyons saw fit to dedicate his company's efforts to blowing any claim to the throne of the Speed King out of the water. And thus exists the XK120 and Jaguar to this day. It is this beginning period that we focus on today, when in the early 50s, a new car appeared in the Colosseum that was more advanced, more powerful, but more importantly, faster than any other. Then, just as suddenly, this fantastic new Olympian vanished, almost as if it were banished. Perhaps even more bemusing was the fact it was made by a lorry manufacturer and came from a country with scant pedigree in luxury car production. Whatever this car was, it was a veritable unicorn. Which was a much better segue before I remembered that a unicorn and a Pegasus aren't the same fucking thing! Directed by the story of Pegaso is as much the story of its founder, engineer Wifredo Ricard. Graduating from his father's nautical school with an industrial engineering degree in his hometown of Barcelona, Ricard was no Nepo baby, designing his first car at the age of just 25. Ricard was an extremely talented engineer with an eclectic career and a penchant for ambitious designs, which is to say very, very complicated. In the mid-1920s, he tried to make his way with his own company, developing a car with a 2.4-litre, dual-overhead cam straight 6, at the time, a very advanced design that perfectly coincided with an economic downturn in Spain that thwarted any potential the car had. In the 30s, his work led him to the racing department of Alfa Romeo. This put him shoulder to shoulder with some of auto engineering's greatest names. Joaquino Colombo, Vittorio Giano, and the leader of Alfa Romeo's race team, Juan Enzo Ferrari. Oh god, not this fucker again! I do an entire fucking video, and I'm still not free! I still have to talk about this motherfucker, you're joking! Enzo and Wifredo didn't get on, which I'm pretty sure lumped Wifredo in with every other man Enzo ever met. After the war, upon recalling Ricard, Enzo protested his sleek oiled hair and smart clothes he wore with a somewhat levantine elegance. Jesus, dude, just kiss him already. Also, um... You don't fucking say, Enzo! Great job! <laughs> but his insults didn't stop there. He affected jackets with sleeves that came far down below his wrists, and shoes with enormously thick rubber soles. The way I see it, Wifredo was just comfy maxing and Enzo was hating. At this point, Wifredo apparently decided to fuck with him, and responded, A great engineer's brain should not be jolted by the inequalities of the ground, and consequently needs to be carefully sprung. 
Fucking hell, I wish I could post like this. By the way, I have a Twitter you can follow. It wasn't just Ricard's looks that incensed Enzo. He also declared one of his engines had a crankshaft that revolved like a skipping rope, and that the car as a whole was outdated, good only for scrap or a museum. It's not explicit to which of Ricard's two most prominent designs for Alfa Romeo Enzo is referring to here, although to throw Enzo a bone, both were, in what was becoming typical Ricard fashion, near Heath Robinson-esque. The first, the 162, is my best guess as to the target of Enzo's biting criticism. It's 3 litre V16, which would have necessitated a long crankshaft that would have been susceptible to warping, was designed in collaboration with legendary engineer Harry Ricardo. Spaghetti crank or not, its wide bank angle helps lower the car's center of gravity, improving handling, with the massive supercharger bolted to the back, enabling it to achieve 490 horsepower on the testbed. Ultimately, the goal was 560. This amount of power from an engine of just 3 liters is fairly impressive now, and in the late 1930s was nothing short of bar setting. The push to produce such an overclocked racing machine interestingly came from high up. Very high up. The rampantly nationalist Mussolini government saw competing in Formula One, then dominated by the German Mercedes and Auto Union, as a way to promote national pride and international prestige. As such, Ricard was encouraged to design a second car, the 512. With a smaller 1.5 litre supercharged flat 12 mounted amidships in the style of the races from Auto Union, it was allowed a lower minimum weight under FIA regulations. Enzo found time to lambast this car too, claiming it to be nothing but a 158 with a rear engine. Look Enzo, I know you want to play with Wifredo's toys, but you've got your own toys back home. Neither of these cars ever got the opportunity to race before Italy joined Germany in its doomed conquest. Not to be deterred, Ricard, during the war, designed a road-going two-seat supercar that mounted the 162's V16, unfortunately sans massive fuck-off supercharger, behind the passenger compartment. Imaginatively dubbed the Tipo 163, it was to be Alfa Romeo's halo car. That's right, in 1941, Ricard designed a mid-engine supercar. Although... If I had a nickel for every interwar period streamlined supercar with a mid-mounted Formula 1 derived V16 that arguably predicted the direction of mid to late century supercars designed by an eccentric ambitious engineer that never made it off the drawing board, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Finally, he also designed a modern car for the post-war era, featuring a 2-litre dual-overhead cam straight 6, monocoque construction, and a rear-mounted transaxle with all-independent suspension. Shockingly forward-thinking tech, considering Alfa Romeo wouldn't produce a car with a similar layout until 1972. I'm going into Ricard's history because it's important context. The point is, if pistons, camshafts, and valves were a canvas, then Ricard was a veritable Picasso. Having spent the entire war designing cars and an aero engine that never made it off the drawing board, Ricard flew mostly under the radar of the Allies and returned to Spain, at which point he was immediately offered a very enticing position at Studebaker of all companies. God, the alt history potential there is incredible. Instead, he was convinced by Spain's Minister of Industry and Commerce to become a CEO of a new company to help kickstart the war-torn country's economic recovery. Ricard doubtlessly jumped at the chance to again run a company of his own. Anasa was established as a state-owned enterprise in Ricard's home city of Barcelona, in a factory formerly of the interwar multinational industrial giant Hispano Suiza, a corporation whose name translates as Spanish-Swiss, and it conducted its post-war operations almost exclusively in France. Unsatisfied with its corporate acronym, the fledgling firm began marketing its products under the much more inspiring Pegaso. If I have to tell you what that translates to, I'm going to- <laughs> But of course, Ricard could not be contained. That little madman Scrimblo just couldn't help himself. As Pegaso rose to the top of Spain's still weak truck market, he saw it as the perfect excuse to immediately begin making a cost no object, no holds barred, all points, no quills, no pillows line of luxury cars. After all, the brand was named after the mythical winged steed Pegasus. Where Ferrari's horse merely pranced, Ricard was intent on flying. Surprisingly, he was allowed to do this. 
Similarly to Mussolini's Italy, the nationalist government of Caudillo Francisco Franco had few qualms with funding extravagant engineering if it could prove Spain's prowess on the world stage. First, he designed a saloon, purportedly with a 4.5 litre V12, but that was soon scrapped in favour of a Grand Tourer to top all Grand Tourers, a car designed to be driven to a race in extreme style and comfort, win the race, and then driven back home. The only concession to formality was the use of a sheet steel frame chassis, allowing the buyer to choose from a variety of venerable coach builders or Pegaso's in-house coachworks, ensuring that no two cars were the same. Besides that, Ricard decided his car would have everything, pushing the limits of what mid-century engineering would allow. The bodies were exclusively constructed of aluminium reducing weight, all independent suspension with a multi-link torsion bar set up at the front and a Dion tube at the rear ensured good road holding, which was only aided by the rear-mounted 5-speed transaxle keeping the car's weight distribution even and its inboard brakes reducing unsprung weight. But the true star of the show was the engine. Your choice of 2.5, 2.8 or 3.2 litres of all aluminium, dry sumped, quad Weber carburetted, dual overhead cam, 32 valve V8 glory. And of course you could option your Pegaso with a supercharger, because this wouldn't be a Ricard design if you couldn't. In maximum trim, this engine could produce an astonishing 360 horsepower. This technology was beyond most Formula One cars of the time, and it wouldn't be until the 1980s that Ferrari and Lamborghini began dabbling with four valves per cylinder in their road cars, and even then, the Pegaso still had one up on them from 30 years beforehand by operating its 32 valves desmodromically. The fuck's that? Oh, would you look at the clock, it's nerd time! In an engine, it's the job of the inlet and exhaust valves to let air and fuel into the engine and exhaust out. Zero points for guessing which does which. Because an engine spins very fast, these valves have to open and close multiple times a second, thousands of times a minute. Opening them is easy, it's closing them that's the difficult part. The vast majority of engines from the origin of the internal combustion engine to this day elected to use very strong springs. If the spring can't pull the valve back fast enough, the phenomenon of valve float occurs which can do anything from limit performance to destroying the engine entirely. Back in the day, when metal manufacturing was largely based on vibes, this was a problem, especially for high revving performance engines. Almost everyone else solved the problem by going overkill on the springs to allow their engines to rev high, but of course, not Ricard, who instead chose a desmodromic setup. This forgoes the spring entirely in favor of a complicated lever system that manually pulls the valve back. Pro, if done right, valve float becomes a distant memory. Con, you have to pay the guy down at the forge triple because holy fucking shit the tolerances! All of this is to say that Ricard's car was a ludicrously complex machine, which was exactly Ricard's intention. What better way to prep his new recruits to design lorries and buses than to cut their teeth on a low tolerance supercar? Of course, it would have been a bit of a shock to the newly graduated engineers. I want a V8. Sure thing, Mr. Ricard. I want the whole thing to be made of aluminium. Okay, sir. I mean, hi, Harmony. I want to connect it to a five-speed transaxle. Oh, oh, my God. With a dry sump. Oh, sir, it's going to be so expensive. It's going to have quad cams. Sir, only racing cars have that sort of... I want 32 valves. Mr. Ricard, please. They're going to be desmodromic. <laughs> Ricard ordered the car to production in 1951. Satisfied he had made the most car of all time, and christened it the Pegaso Z102, the car for the connoisseur. And of course, because it was being built by a nationalised company, taxpayer money was spent to make it. Only the best for the glorious people's supercar! Speed and power for the proletariat! Compared to its contemporaries from Ferrari, Jaguar and Maserati, it blew all of them out of the water both in performance and in looks. Most Z102s were bodied by Touring of Milan. Some of these cars look fantastic, and while those fitted with what I call the sniffer bonnet may not exactly be pretty, they certainly have presence. 
Most others were clothed either in the swooping, elegant French curves of Sauchik or Anasa's own body shop, which ranged from the unfortunately frumpy production model to the car of tomorrow. Fun fact, this car was bought by Rafael Trujillo, Generalissimo of the Dominican Republic. Funny how Ricard continuously attracted the benevolence of brutal dictatorial regimes. It wasn't long before the Z102 began to prove its performance. In September of 1953, at a top speed event held by the Belgian Automobile Club near the town of Jabeke, a Z102 recorded an average speed over a flying mile of 151 miles an hour, obliterating the record held by the Jaguar XK120, although the record wasn't fully recognised internationally. Curiously, the Pegaso that took the record was not the car intended for the run. A special twin-supercharged Bissoluro car had been custom-built for the event, which ironically differed too much from the production model and thus wouldn't have been counted. When the Bussoluro's engine exploded, the production model brought as a backup was used instead. Funnily enough, this car used the supercharged 2.8 litre, not the 3.2, so it wasn't even the most powerful Pegaso. Taking the speed record is great and all, but the real prestige in the 50s was on the racetrack. A factory team of three cars was assembled. Then one caught fire on the test bench, and in the summer of 1953, the remaining two made the trip north for Le Mans. Practice begins. The drivers are getting used to their cars and the imposing circuit. Juan Hover, driving a 2.8 litre supercharged Pegaso Spider, passes under the Dunlop Bridge. He's going fast. Too fast. He doesn't slow down, or maybe he can't. Hover loses control and... Pegaso's lead car careened into the barrier at 120 miles an hour. Miraculously, Hover survived, being thrown from the wreckage but suffering serious injuries to his left leg. Unable to ascertain if the crash was caused by driver error or a technical fault, the previous year's Le Mans had been forgotten by the Pegaso team due to issues with the brakes, Ricard erred on the side of safety and withdrew the remaining car from the race, ending Pegaso's Le Mans hopes before the race had even started. Le Mans was now off the table for Pegaso. Ricard's dedication to his supercar program was being increasingly seen as a liability by the rest of the board. This was a taxpayer-funded industrial vehicle company, after all. This was a massive blow. Participation in Le Mans was the gateway to the supercar club, and even then, it didn't guarantee success. Hell, some of the regular faces in Le Mans around this time are earmarked for future videos of mine, and given what I tend to make videos on, that doesn't bode well for them. But there was still at least one other race in the mid-50s that offered a similar level of cultural cachet. The Carrera Panamericana, a grueling endurance rally, a border-to-border -border crusade, thousands of feet above sea level across the plateau spine of Mexico. Though short-lived, held only five times in its original run, the Carrera Panamericana has a gilded legacy, living on in the name of two different Porsche models, one of which debuted 55 years after the original race was cancelled. Due to being held closer to the US, the race had received early interest from the lucrative American market, boosting the race's prominence immediately, and already tales of its magnitude have been regaled on both sides of the Atlantic. All of this caught the attention of Pegaso's race team. Unable to convince the board to provide sufficient funds, who should reappear to fund the project but Generalissimo Trujillo of the Dominican Republic himself, completing Ricard's trifecta of dictator benefactors? A spider with the full fat 3.2 supercharged V8 was prepped, plastered with decals of El Dominicano in honor of its sponsor, and the team set off for the 1954 Carrera Panamericana. What happened next is a near comedy of errors. Due to complications of warehouse storage, the car was first shipped to London, then flown to New York before finally being shipped down to Mexico. Since Franco's Spain did not maintain diplomatic relations with Mexico, the race team similarly had to take a detour via London before both team and car finally arrived at the starting point in Tuzla Gutierrez. I'm sorry, I tried my best with that. Immediately, they were met with a nasty surprise. Is that the bio 
To get the most out of the engine, it had been tuned to run on high octane fuel, and anticipating the low quality of fuel readily available in Mexico, the team had brought barrels of Primo petrol with them. Evidently, nobody on the Pegaso team had fucking read the rules of the race because this was against the regulations. Cars were only allowed to use fuel sourced from local petrol stations, so countless hours of finely tuning the carburettors was wasted. Logistics among the team as a whole was reportedly shambolic, perhaps because they'd officially entered the race under Alan Guyberson, who was likely devoting much more of his work to the Phil Hill piloted Ferrari he'd also entered. Nonetheless, Against these odds, the Z102 proved a thoroughbred barnstormer. Perhaps the drivers were gripped by something primordial. Joaquin Palacio Power was a driver of the Pegaso withdrawn from the 1953 Le Mans, his chance to prove himself on the legendary circuit denied, while Celso Fernandez was Pegaso's factory test driver, having set the speed record at Yabeca that remained in question by some international bodies. Both car and drivers had chips on their shoulders and a lot to prove, so maybe it shouldn't come as a surprise that they drove like hell was after them. Maintaining blistering pace as the route took them higher, when they tore into Mexico City, the terminus of the third stage, they found themselves third in their class and fourth overall, putting them in league with the finest from Ferrari and Porsche. They were within reach of a podium finish of an event nearly half wouldn't even complete, 34 cars had already pulled out before reaching the capital. There was a hell of a lot of Mexico to go, but Pegaso's fortunes were finally looking up. Until, midway through the fourth stage, Palacio's view was obstructed by a crowd when approaching a turn at over 120 miles an hour. He misjudged the corner, and the car careened off the road, rolling over and catching fire. Again, inconceivably, Palacio survived, Rather than joining the other two competitors who died that race, he escaped with a fractured left shoulder blade. But there was no saving the car. High in the mountains, on a sunny November day in 54, somewhere between Leon and Mexico City, the dream of a Spanish supercar burned to ash. Without any racing success to speak of, the Picasso name simply didn't carry much weight outside Spain, and as such, the astronomical asking price was hard to justify. The board had grown increasingly displeased with Ricard's folly. By the mid-50s, Picasso's position at the top of Spain's truck market was finally paying dividends. With the economy on its way to a miracle, Picasso needed to focus on producing the commercial vehicles that both fueled and were demanded by that growth. As such, the sports cars were given low priority, and production began being moved out of the Barcelona factory to a new facility near Madrid. Consequently, Ricard's blueprinted Formula One racer, a four-cylinder car that otherwise resembled his own Alpha 512, was not given the green light. Meanwhile, sports car production slowed to a crawl and resulted in the effective cancellation of the car's successor. The Z103 was intended with engines that were more simple, but as large as 4.7 litres, topping 170 at full pelt, but only three were made. This larger engine was also intended for a near Rolls-Royce sized luxury saloon, the Z104. However, this project too seems to have been caught up in the crossfire and never made it off the drawing board. Production of the 102 ceased by 1958, and even Ricard admitted in a 1959 interview that the sports car project had been at least temporarily stopped after just 84 Z102s had been built. At the end of 59, Wilfredo Ricard resigned as the CEO of Anasa, having designed the lorries and buses that were now becoming iconic symbols of the country's burgeoning economic miracle, but whose inarguably vain sports car program had yielded wanting results. With him gone, it was scrapped entirely. Meanwhile, Pegaso would live on, continuing to produce a wide variety of trucks, military vehicles, hell, they even went back to racing, competing in the Dakar Rally and the European Truck Championship, but never returning to the world of cars. After the end of the economic miracle, so too was the miracle over for Anasa, and after a decade of lackluster sales, the state-owned company was sold to Avico in 1990. Four years later, the last vehicle bearing the Pegaso name left the Madrid factory. The only two reminders of Spain's own industrial giant is a neighborhood in northeast Madrid named for it, and the old Pegaso J4, a Morris-derived van that, if Spanish Wikipedia is to be believed, 
remains the workhorse of choice for cash-strapped tradies rattling up and down out of ears from Bilbao to Malaga. Pegaso is probably the greatest what-if in supercar history. It's almost hard to believe it flopped. Then again, the car for the connoisseur can, by definition, not be for everyone. Perhaps they should have known their time as an Olympian in the great supercar coliseum would be short-lived. When Pegasus tried to reach Mount Olympus and join the Pantheon, Zeus struck him dead for daring to even try. But in other versions of the myth, Pegasus joined Zeus's stable, was given the honor of carrying his thunderbolts, and was transformed into a constellation in his honor. I hope, by making this video, I'm helping to canonize Pegaso, move us over to the other timeline where their name is cast among the stars, alongside the greats. Perhaps a spark of this other world shone through at the final event of the 1990 European Truck Championship. Just months after the fate sealing sail to Avico, the team likely knew the end of their racing days was imminent. They'd had a mediocre season thus far, managing a meager third place here and there. But now, here, they were the protagonists in too many stories to fail. In their last ever race, Pegaso's factory team made a 1-2 finish in both rounds at the Circuito del Jarama, less than 20 miles from the Anasa factory. Like a very different myth, Pegaso at least had its swan song. Hello, welcome to the unscripted end segment. I just want to start off by saying I know it's been a long time since the last video, so if you're still here, if you're sticking with me, Thank you a lot, and thank you especially to my patrons who have stuck with me and continue supporting me despite months of no video. I did upload a couple of teasers for the patrons while I was working on this video, so in the future, if you want to get any sneak peeks as to what I might be working on, maybe consider subscribing to the Patreon! <laughs> and a violent reaction to saying that sentence, I'm sorry. One thing I wasn't quite able to fit into the video is that in that final interview Ricard did, he said he wanted to produce a small sports saloon to the same standard as the supercars. I saw words here and there about a V6 that had been developed a couple of years prior, and so maybe it would have had that engine, which would have been pretty cool. You know, sort of Spanish V6 rival to a Jag Mark II. But then, Ricard resigned months later, so, yeah, nah. Just before I sign off, uh, I will say that the reason why this video took so long is because I'm a final year uni student. I have so much work. It's ungodly. So, forgive me for prioritizing my 10,000 word dissertation over this. There will, as a result of that, unfortunately, probably be another big gap between this video and the next one. But I know what I'm gonna make it on, so it will happen. Eventually, TM. I'll be damned if I become the valve of car YouTube. It's not gonna happen. With all that said, I'll see you all next time. Bye bye I've come to make an announcement. Enzo Ferrari's a bitch-ass motherfucker. He pissed on my fucking car. That's right, he took his Italian fucking pepperoni dick out and he pissed on my fucking car and he said his dick was this big. And I said, that's disgusting. So I'm making a call out post on my Twitter.com. Enzo Ferrari, your cars suck dick. They're as fast as a tractor except way slower. And guess what? Here's what my car looks like. That's right, baby. All valves, no compromise, no cast iron. Look at that, it looks like a biblically accurate car angel. You fuck my car, so guess what? I'm gonna fuck your company! That's right, this is what you get! My super laser spite! Except I'm not going for Ferrari. I'm gonna go higher. I'm going for the whole industry! How'd you like that, Henry Ford? I pissed on your industry, you idiot!
You have 23 months before the spike droplets hit the fucking racetrack. Now get the fuck out of my sight before I send my sights on you too.